Chapman is interested. Dr. Chapman is interested in psychiatry, neurodiversity, disability, medical humanities, social epistemology, critical theory, among other topics. And most of their research has focused on disability and mental health advocacy. They have been particularly interested in how the insights of disabled, mad, and neurodivergent people both challenge and provide alternatives to widely held views in medicine, philosophy, ethics, and political thought, and how these alternatives can translate into real world change. They're the author of several papers, notably in 2020, The Reality of Autism on the Metaphysics of Disorder and Diversity, published in Philosophical Psychology, and in 2021, Neurodiversity and the Social Ecology of Mental Functions, published in Perspectives on Psychological Science. At the moment, they're working on a book titled Empire of Normality, Neurodiversity and Capitalism, and today, their talk is on neurodivergent power. Robert Chapman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to share the screen quickly. Um, okay, you can see that. Great. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and for the warm welcome. Um, I'm uh, just to say I'm away at the moment and I'm sitting on a hotel uh, bed and I've made a kind of tower of pillows and put my laptop on it so if it like falls over or something don't worry nothing terrible has happened it's just my tower has collapsed um so um I've slightly changed the title of this talk after submitting the the title I've changed it from uh on new on neurodivergent power to on neurodivergent or mad power um and I'll explain that in a moment um, but really what I want to do here is, this is very much a work in progress. It's not something I've like published anything on yet or anything like that. It's just a kind of idea I want to put out there and test and see what people think and if it's helpful or if, if there's if maybe, it's, maybe it's a bad idea. Um, so ob obviously any feedback is, is really helpful. And I was really thinking a lot um, about the um, Black Power movement in America in the 1960s and 70s. And often, um, uh, social movements borrow sort of ideas or are influenced by each other. Um, and I was wondering how something like that might translate into madness or neurodiversity um, and whether that would be useful and if it if it names something. And I'm, I'm going to make a, kind, a case for that to an extent, although um, I, I'm not completely sure about this, but we'll, we'll see. I'll give some examples and see, see if this is helpful at all. Um, quick two notes on terminology. Um, so I'm going to talk both about what I call mad or neurodivergent power. And I use both of these terms very broadly, um, more or less to anyone who falls outside the kind of uh, cognitive or affective or behavioral norms of a society and who is also tends to be seen as disabled or ill or in need of fixing or recovery in some sense. So I use both the terms in the kind of broadest sense possible. Um, and today I'm going to like roughly map them onto the same broad groups of people although I don't think they're completely interchangeable. Um, for instance, it's worth noting, I take madness and neurodivergence as concepts to have slightly different emphasis. Um, madness is often like, for instance, associated as a kind of clash with reason or rationality or the dominant rationality of a society, whereas neurodivergence might be uh, slightly a, a different emphasis. Um, but I'm just gonna kind of switch between these, depending on which is more relevant for the given example that I'm talking about at the time. And so I initially titled this presentation on neurodivergent power, but as I, that was before I actually made the presentation. And as I've, as I've been making it, I've ended up focusing a bit more on mad power. And that's just mainly because I've ended up focusing more on historical examples that were prior to the coining of neurodivergence, which is a very recent coining in the kind of early 2000s by um, Cassie and Asas and Mazu. Um, so sometimes the, the term madness or mad was more appropriate and sometimes neurodivergence is more appropriate. Um, but I hope these are kind of continuous in, in to a fair extent at least. Um, okay, so when I first started thinking about mad power or neurodivergent power, and again, as I've already said, I was thinking, I've been reading lots of the um, uh, leaders of the, the black power movement from the 1960s and 70s. I kind of thought, well, it's very obvious that, that you could borrow that and talk about like 
be influenced by that and talk about something like mad power. And as soon as I thought of it, I thought, well, that's so obvious. In fact, it must have been invented already. Someone must have done that. And and I still think um, that it's just too obvious that this, it, it was very, it, it must have been done. But when I started um, searching for it, I couldn't really find anything like that, a clear articulation of mad power in that particular sense. I found loads of other uses of mad power. And there's a couple of just um, examples on the screen here. So for example, this image in the middle is there's, there's a company which um, is a full service generator and electrical distribution rental company, um, for instance, and they call themselves mad power. But that's like nothing in the sense that I mean it. Um, but this itself was kind of interesting to me. So I, so like, I was thinking, if it is such an obvious kind of concept, obvious kind of borrowing from, from, a, from a kind of parallel movement, um, because of course there were mad movements in the 60s and 70s, those kind of anti-psychiatry movement and so forth. Um, why, why haven't we got this concept already? Why haven't we already had it for decades? And there could be various reasons. Um, I think the question of why we don't have it is an interesting one in itself. And I'm going to try and like, my suspicion is that there's some kind of thing someone kind of, might call it epistemic injustice or hermeneutical injustice. There's been a kind of erasure of mad power. And part of what I want to claim is that mad power or neurodivergent power is something that has existed for a long time. There are many historical examples and um, we've actually, these are actually been erased from our histories of madness and histories of neurodivergence in an important sense. And so that's part of the kind of case I'm going to make today. And I want to begin precisely with a key example. And for this, we need to go back to the revolutionary period in England in the 17th century. So you don't need to know loads about this period, but there was kind of, uh, this is like Puritan England. Uh, there's a very powerful king and a small kind of parliament which has very limited powers and it's mostly like very wealthy people. And they're not really, uh, they don't have the kind of interests of most people um, in, in mind basically. Um, and you have this revolutionary period in the mid 17th century where there's all these groups, um, kind of the diggers, the levelers, and the ranters who I'm going to talk about, um, who all want to make society much more equal in, in different ways. Um, some of them are kind of proto, almost like communists or anarchists in various ways. And you have this revolutionary period where eventually the king is executed. And then there's like um, this kind of brief dictatorship with uh, Cromwell. And then the monarchy is restored, um, but parliament is given much greater powers. So there is a kind of, a, a kind of revolution which kind of doesn't completely uh, go, go the way some, some would hope, um, but then you still have some counter-revolutionary forces, but then you still have kind of greater democracy at the end of it. Um, so I think there's certainly some good comes out of it. And the group I want to focus on uh, from the time as an example are the ones called the Ranters. Um, so the Ranters are a group thought to number in the thousands, although it isn't completely clear, and were very popular among the urban poor in, you know, in, in, in cities across England. And they were one of the groups, along with other groups such as the diggers and the levelers, who were, were part of this kind of rather radical, um, radical groups during this revolutionary period. Um, I see the Ranters as a kind of proto kind of libertarian communist uh, movement. Um, in particular, they called for the abolition of private property, although they were very much libertarians as well, or something you might call proto-libertarians. Um, something they're really associated with now is, is, a, is a kind of proto-sexual liberation movement. They called for, and importantly practiced, versions of what we would now call polyamory, uh, what they called sodomy and buggery, and so forth. And they, they were very much pushing back against you know, uh, norms about how, how you were supposed to uh, be sexually. So they were kind of had this like vision of sexual liberation, uh, vision of uh, what might uh, abolition of private property. Um, there's a picture um, on the bottom here of people kind of dancing around. Uh, they were known for kind of drinking and dancing and, and generally like having a having a good time as they understood it. Um, okay, so uh, among other things, they were also pantheists. They saw God in everything and everyone. A uh, very radical view for the time, very dangerous to hold that view. Um, and again, another very radical view for the time, they questioned the literal existence of heaven and hell and the existence of sin and suggested that sin may be a product of the imagination. Um, those views are perhaps not so radical now, but again, at the time they were, they, they were a heretical. Um, 
so this this group had a range of um, a range of views. They were kind of interrelated, um, and they published a bunch of pamphlets over over, over the decade. Um, and they also actually lived, tried to live in these alternative ways. They tried to change how they were living. Um, and they also went around kind of preaching a lot and things like this. Um, so why do I use these as an example of mad power? Well, I want to draw attention to a publication from 1650 called A Justification of the Mad Crew in Their Ways and Principles. And this is an incredible publication. It's anonymous. There's no, there's no author. There's suspected authors who are, all, who are kind of like leading ranters. And this is very widely seen by historians as a kind of ranter manifesto, even though we don't know exactly who the author is. And in this, they talk about the kind of things I've just mentioned, the kind of they call for the need of the abolition of private property, and, and they talk about their theological views and so on. Um, but interestingly, they, they very much identify themselves as mad and as the mad crew. And they do something that we would now call something like reclaiming. They talk about how people have called them mad and they called them they're like, well, we are the mad crew and we're going to justify themselves. And something that's important here to note is that they didn't call themselves the ranters. That was a name given to them by their critics. Um, and there were lots of critics at the time. People were terrified of them. Not uh, maybe like ordinary people, but certainly the authorities were terrified of them. And there was kind of like journalistic reports and so on. Um, among much else, so they say in, in this document, uh, these people who ye call mad have learnt this wisdom, yea, this wisdom is theirs and lives in them, and it saith, what is mine is everyone's, and what is everyone's is mine. This is the kind of move to the abolition of property that everyone should own everything communally. Um, this related to their theological views, their pantheonists, they think God is in everyone, and therefore they think everyone should own everything equally, and uh, and so on. So, that, so their view is kind of, um, has some kind of coherence to it. It's it's uh, it's really interesting to to look into. Um, so they call themselves the Mad Crew. Um, they don't call themselves the Ranters. Uh, their name was kind of suppressed, and they get called the Ranters by history. Uh, but they call themselves the Mad Crew in at least this publication, and they reclaim this term. And they've been called mad by other people. They weren't just called mad. Many of them were kind of. Um, some of them were even incarcerated in Bethlehem Hospital, the kind of infamous uh, London uh, kind of uh, proto asylum. Um, so one of the leading members, William Everard, who was previously a digger, but then became a ranter, was incarcerated in Bethlehem Hospital precisely for his ranting activities, for example. And just to quote one 1651 report, which was fairly typical of the time, many of ranting Everard's party are lunatic and exceedingly distracted they talk very high against the parliament and this present government, for which some of them have received the lash. Um, they actually received much worse than the lash. They were kind of really violently suppressed in all sorts of ways. Some of them had stakes driven through their tongue. Some of them were locked up in all sorts of ways. And um, some of them, some you know, um, and all sorts of other, of other horrible things like that. Um, so their views were seen as a kind of real threat to the dominant order in some sense. What they were doing was completely heretical. Um, they wanted to challenge the kind of certain things about uh, norms of sexuality and stuff like that, and uh, religious beliefs um, and and uh, social hierarchies and, and economic hierarchies. So I propose that this, and I want to begin with this, is a paradigm example of what I want to call mad or neurodivergent power. These are people who self-identified as mad in at least one publication and challenge the dominant rationality of the time, um, both in how in their in their theory, but also in their practice and how they acted and how they tried to live. They were completely outside the dominant rationality. People called them mad, people called them lunatic and literally locked them up for this. Um, and they were kind of a, a kind of early version of reclaiming madness, um, the kind that you see again uh, now in recent decades. Um, so I want to begin uh, just with them and keep them in mind. They're in some sense such a threat to the dominant order. Not only did they need to be suppressed, but their very name needed to be suppressed. Not even just in that time as well. Um, I mean, more recently, um, some conservative historian has, uh, have tried to actually draw uh, to kind of claim that they were a myth and they didn't really exist. Um, and in response to this, um, other historians have kind of shown lots more archival evidence and shown they you know, definitely did exist. Um, so there's been various attempts to kind of suppress them and suppress understanding and knowledge of them in various ways. 
Um, okay. So something important here is that I didn't learn about these in studying the history of madness at all. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've been reading stuff about the history of madness for years and years and years now. Um, it's something I'm, you know, I'm, I have a, a kind of a research interest in. Um, and I'd never come across them in, in reading these. Uh, I came across them, I just happened to be reading a recent England, uh, a recent history of revolutionary England, which spoke about the ranters. I thought they sounded really interesting. When I looked into them a lot more, I then came across the justification of the mad group. Um, and again, this itself is interesting to me. They aren't in histories of madness, as far as I know. Um, even the histories of madness, which are more kind of critical, uh, the ones from uh, maybe like Foucault or the anti-psychiatry movement and stuff like that, they don't include like the ranters either. Um, I think one way of making sense of this, why aren't they there? If they identified as mad, they said they are mad and they published this pamphlet and they were kind of activists, right? Is thinking about how madness has been understood as a kind of lack or a deficit or a form of vulnerability, always something like that, not as a form of power. Um, and if you look at, if you, if you understand madness like that, if you understand it like that, then there's really no space left, just if it's, if it's reduced to that, there's no space left for understanding or conceptualizing neurodivergent power or for seeing it. So it, it's not like I think there's some kind of conspiracy or something like that to like, you know, hide knowledge of the mad crew or, or similar. It's just, I think that the way we've thought about this uh, in some sense hinders our understanding or ability to recognize um, these kind of cases as cases of mad power. But the, the mad crew, um, they were powerful. As I've said, they are widely seen uh, as a threat to the dominant order. Um, so my claim is going to be that there's been a kind of hermeneutical lacuna, a kind of gap in our understanding that might stop us from recognizing mad power in some sense. Um, so I guess we could use all sorts of words for this. There's like technical words like epistemic injustice or hermeneutical injustice. And I don't want to go into, like, I don't want to propose something like a really precise conceptualization of exactly how, how we should make sense of that. Um, just the, the way we've conceptualized madness and it's always being conceptualized um, doesn't leave much space for this. So there is some kind of stifling of that understanding. And so really my hope with this concept or part of my hope is that we can kind of recognize a different side of madness. And just to be clear, this isn't to deny any of the like hardships of madness or anything like that, um, or that, you know, uh, or to deny disability. I think these things can coexist. Um, that they can, you know, you can struggle at the individual level, but have a kind of collective power as a movement or as, a, as an organization or as a group or, or so on. Um, okay. So that's the mad crew. Um, I now want to move on to further conceptualize it and to, in relation to, I think what's the most obvious kind of contemporary uh, comparison, which is uh, pride, mad pride, neurodivergent pride, autistic pride, and so forth. So from around the 1990s, um, we begin to see conceptions of mad pride, neurodivergent pride, and so on. Um, influenced by earlier conceptions of gay and lesbian pride primarily, as well as other kinds of pride too. And homosexuality, to use the kind of historical term, was pathologized um, as, a, as a mental disorder, as I'm sure people know, um, until, until just some decades ago. And I think pride was kind of part of the powerful tool for combating this, as well as like other forms of stigma and stuff like that, and for like generating solidarity and all, all kinds of really important things. So the thought is that similarly with madness or neurodivergence, pride could be and has been, I think, a powerful tool for challenging deficit-based representations or shame or stigma and things like this, a tool for, for, for political purposes. Um, although there are different variations of mad pride and autistic and neurodivergent pride, as I will talk about uh, shortly. Okay. Um, so basically, but what the general things these do is help mad or neurodivergent people push back against neuronormativity in all sorts of ways. But I don't think that mad pride or neurodivergent pride is exactly the same as uh, mad or neurodivergent power. I think these are, I'm going to suggest that they're slightly different to each other, um, uh, that they come apart, and I still think we gain something further from naming and recognizing mad or neurodivergent power. 
Um, so I just want to say first about one kind of pride or, or so kind of set of discourses or conceptualizations of pride um, that I think are very different. And these are what I call the individ individualistic conceptions of pride, which are often related to uh, people saying something's a superpower. There's an image here, it says autism is my superpower, and it's got a kind of Superman uh, badge with a badge uh, with a puzzle piece inside it. So that's just something, there are many examples of similar things to that. Um, there's also a picture of a book which was quite influential, um, Thomas Armstrong's book, The Power of Neurodiversity, Unleashing the Advantages of Your Differently Wired Brain. This was a um, 2010 book. It has chapters on different forms of neurodivergence. And each one, it kind of says, well, here are some strengths for, and it kind of reviews some of the evidence of like various strengths you might associate with autism or dyslexia or, 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 or whatever else. Um, so this is quite a, 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 a kind of common thing you see on, it's often on social media, it's often on, on various things. Um, it's a kind of strength-based approach. And it turns the kind of pathologized individual into someone with superpowers. Um, and sometimes this is related to one version of pride. Um, again, it, often on social media and stuff like this, I don't want to kind of quote anyone in particular because I don't want to like, you know, uh, draw attention to any particular person in this, but like you often hear things kind of people saying like, I am proud as an autistic person because I've got good logical abilities or I'm creative or I'm very honest and things like this. So it's a certain version of pride um, and the term power is used, superpower or the power of neurodiversity or whatever. Um, but um, in a very particular way, it's about individual strengths. So this might be helpful at the individual level. So I don't really want to say people shouldn't do this or anything like that, um, but I'm still a bit critical of this. And I don't think it's an expression at all of neurodivergent power in the sense that I mean it. Um, when we looked at the case of the ranters, they had the kind of authorities and the ruling class and so on, actually saw them as a kind of, as a threat in some sense. Um, so much that they had to kind of suppress them. They saw that there was some kind of power there. Um, I don't think with this kind of individualist conception of superpowers, the, the state or the ruling class or authorities or whatever have any reason to fear this, any reason to see it as a form of political power. And in fact, they're likely to welcome it, right? Because they'll say, well, all these people we thought were uh, just disabled and just had were kind of you know conceptualized as a drain on the economy and stuff like that. Just to be clear, that's not what I think. That's me saying what they think. Um, now we can see that they've got superpowers, so they become exploitable, that you can kind of mine them for productivity and these kinds of things. So um, it's it's actually something which is generally quite welcomed. It's not a, it doesn't challenge the dominant order in any sense, it just slightly changes how we conceptualize certain um, individuals. The mad crew, in my view, were not powerful because they had individual superpowers. They were powerful at the collective level. Their power was a kind of collective consciousness, a collective way of acting, a collective way of trying to build a new form of life, which challenged the dominant rationality and order in some sense. So I think that's very different to this kind of modern conception of uh, superpowers and, and of the power of neurodiversity in this sense that, uh, say, Thomas Armstrong includes in his book or so forth. So that's one conception of pride. There are other conceptions of pride, I think, which are you also see fairly regularly. I'd associate this probably more with mad pride and some conceptions of, of neurodivergent pride, um, which are more collectivist and more cultural. And I think these are more directly influenced by LGBTQ uh, plus um, conceptions of pride, which are kind of like pride in neurodivergent or mad histories or cultures and things like that. Um, and these are kind of for generating things like social connection, celebration and remembrance and solidarity, rather than being about individual advantage. And so this is much more in line with what I've called mad power or neurodivergent power. Um, and I think it could, can kind of complement it and they can complement each other in, in various important ways. And yet, I don't think they're identical still. I don't think they're exactly the same thing. I think there's some clear examples where you have one without the other. Um, so the first example is of an example of pride without power is the example of bubbles in the park. So there's an image on the right here. This is a, um, a, a advert set up by an autism charity, a Scottish autism charity called Understanding Autism. And it's for a kind of like family day in the park, bubbles in the park for autistic pride. Um, now this is a very nice thing and it's, I think it's really good. Um, 
but I don't think there's a, a kind of form of, of power in the sense that I've used it for uh, the mad crew there. There is a conception of pride, but it very much isn't really, um, it's not, it's, if it's doing something, it's just kind of carving out some little space for acceptance without chain, challenging the kind of any kind of dominant system or order or anything like that. So I think that's still quite different. There, there's cases of pride without this conception of neurodivergent power. And just to give another example of power without pride, uh, the Socialist Patients Collective. Um, so the Socialist Patients Collective were this group kind of uh, active, well, they're still active in a certain way, but they were mainly active in West Germany uh, in the 1970s. And they were communists, they were anti-capitalist, and their manifesto, which there's an image of here, was called Turn Illness Into a Weapon. Um, they were a really interesting and radical group. They thought that illness was the only way of life under capitalism. capitalism. It was impossible to be mentally healthy, basically. Um, and that they decided as a group of mad or uh, ill as they identified people to, as they say, turn this into a weapon, um, in their case, against the capitalist state. Um, they did all sorts of interesting things. They sort of um, uh, took over parts of a university and tried to build what they called a people's university where they generated kind of mad knowledges and things like this. Um, I definitely think that this is an expression of, neuro of mad or neurodivergent power, um, but they didn't have a conception of pride. And they were shut down by the authorities, by the way, lots of them were, uh, kind of ended up on various charge with various charges and stuff like this. Um, so the authorities came down really hard on them because they did see them as a, as, a, as a threat. They didn't want this to spread. They didn't want their ideology to become legitimized and, and, and seen as um, something for people to rally around. It was actually something there was significant efforts at shutting that down. But there's no conception of pride in this, at least as far as I can see. Um, but there is power. So they're not talking about like cultural pride or something like that. They just bypass that completely. Um, so I think you can have conceptions of collective pride which do work well with what I've called mad power or, or neurodivergent power, but um, they do come apart because you can have both pride without power and power without pride. Okay, so just want to say a bit about the concept of black power. Um, so this is, I guess, some of the things that were getting me thinking about this. Um, so. It did, the, the concept does arise a bit earlier and it, people date it to different, different places, but I think the first real key book on black power um, is the book Black Power, uh, The Politics of Liberation in America, published in 1967 by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton. Um, and it's this kind of seminal text in, in, in black power. Um, interestingly, they related to pride there to black pride, but they don't equate them with each other too. Um, here's just one quote from page 56, the racial and cultural personality of the black community must be preserved and that community must win its freedom while preserving its cultural integrity. Integrity includes a pride in the, self, in the sense of self-acceptance, not chauvinism, in being black, in historical attainments and contributions of black people. So they do have this, there is this kind of like cultural and historical sense of pride, but it's still not exactly the same uh, as black power. Black power really emphasized uh, black self-determination, economic empowerment, and the development of various cultural institutions. So very importantly, something that groups like the Black Panthers uh, really pushed for was the um, development of, of black studies departments in universities. That was one of their, uh, a thing they really fought for and a big part of the reason why there are black studies departments today. Uh, also um, book, bookshops, uh, cooperatives, and, and so on. Um, so uh, beyond this, there were, uh, there's a kind of a huge range of different ways this term is used. Um, lots of them were kind of Marxist-Leninists as well, of course, and the Black Panthers. Um, Stokely Carmichael himself was like more of a pan-Africanist and had, had kind of some sympathy for socialism. Um, so they didn't have a completely like coherent ideology shared between everyone who used this concept, but it was generally used in these, these various ways. And usually with a kind of liberatory aim to challenge the dominant kind of order uh, in some sense. Um, so I think this is interesting. So aside from the kind of example I've, examples I've given already, for mad or neurodivergent power, we might add cases uh, of things like neurodivergent cooperatives or advocacy groups, uh, or perhaps mad studies or neurodiversity studies departments. 
um, if they're you know led by mad people or neurodivergent people. Um, or these are the kind of things that you might be with the concept of mad or neurodivergent power be able to kind of fight for or to conceptualize or to argue for or to try to make. Um, of course, we can try to make them anyway, but this is one way of one way of thinking about it. Um, okay, so I just want to say a little bit about the importance of intention by another example of someone who influenced my thinking slightly here, um, Huey P. Newton. Um, so Huey P. Newton was, a, uh, again, an influential, uh, he was a Black Panther leader uh, and a, a great philosopher, um, among other things. Um, in his first book, his autobiography, Revolutionary Suicide, he proposes his concept of revolutionary suicide. And importantly, so it, he's not talking about suicide in the standard, in the clinical sense here, really. He's, he's more talking about he's concerned with what people now call deaths of despair, when people are kind of subjugated and oppressed and end up kind of, you know, getting ill and dying in various ways and dying very young uh, and so on. And he conceptualized that as what he called a form of reactionary suicide. And he saw it as affecting lots of black communities uh, around him. And just to be clear, when he says reactionary suicide, he's not using reactionary to refer to the individuals who die. It's, it's refers to the causes, which the social causes of, of deaths of despair. Um, and he was concerned to kind of combat this. So um, proposes revolutionary suicide as a kind of, uh, a kind of alternative to this and, and tries to conceptualize this. Um, in some sense, it's an individual action or can be, but it's taken as part of a collective court struggle. Um, so this is traditionally a concept associated more with black power. Um, one question I think you could ask is whether it could also be seen as a form of mad power, it's in relation to things like, you know, despair and, and maybe what we would now call depression and things like this. And instead of, uh, you know, responding to that in one sense, trying to develop space to, to develop in, in another sense, but in relation to, um, to, to, to more of a, a kind of black power perspective. Um, a question would be, how could we distinguish between the two here? Because it seems like it could, it definitely is in kind of service of a, of a, of a black power kind of movement, but could it also be conceptualized as a form of mad power? Um, I think probably one thing that might be important here is about the intention or the explicit aim of the effort. So in this case, the explicit aim was in support of black liberation, not mad liberation. Um, so perhaps it could be conceptualized as a form of mad power, but only if it was more explicitly intended in that way. I think that might be important there. That could be contested, but I think, I think that might be important. So I'm just going to add that as a kind of uh, uh, something which I think is part of what we might call mad power or neurodivergent power. Um, okay, so I'm coming towards the end now. Um, this is quite a short talk because I, uh, basically ran out, ran out of things to, to say about this, which were coherent basically. And I really, I want to hear, like I'm interested in kind of hearing what other people think. And this is a very preliminary definition just based on some of the things I've said. So it's not supposed to be like a watertight philosophical definition, which is like necessary and sufficient conditions. This is just like a very general first attempt at a, a preliminary definition. So it'd be instances of self-identified mad or neurodivergent, et cetera, parties, organizations, or groups, militantly organizing in some sense to challenge the dominant order, the rationality or ideology of a given society. In the most extreme cases, this would be to fundamentally change the nature of that society in line with the concerns or perspectives of mad or neurodivergent people. Um, but it could also be, as I've said more locally, for instance, through the creation of things like neurodivergent cultural institutions or cooperatives or so forth. So there could be more localized um, instances of, of, of this kind of manifestations of power. And I think this would typically, but perhaps not necessarily, and that's that's worth thinking about, I think, uh, be with a kind of liberatory focus. At the very least, in so far as dominant norms are almost by definition, in my view, oppressive or at least exclusionary of neurodivergent people. Um, so that's my preliminary attempt at the definition. Um, okay, so why do I think this concept is important? What's the significance of it? Um, I guess I thought it's worth just putting out there and, 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 and testing 
um, for, for a bunch of reasons. But so firstly, um, as I've tried to show, I think MAD or neurodivergent power named something that has long existed um, and does actually exist. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm a realist about this in some sense. I don't know what sense, I haven't thought about it that much, but like in some sense, I think it's, I think the MAD crew were, did express something that we could call MAD power. Um, but we haven't had a kind of word for this um, as far as I know. Um, so our understanding of it has been overlooked or stifled or erased in some sense. Um, so I think it might be helpful for that reason. And my hope really is that this concept in, on the one hand might be helpful for reinterpreting the past, uh, for recognizing MAD or neurodivergent power, for recognizing that it's been with us for a long time in some sense in various ways and manifestations, no less than have things like the asylums or diagnoses or various, um, all sorts of other things we're more familiar with. Um, so I wonder what a history of madness would look like if it focused on mad power, or at least alongside, uh, al alongside other things we're more familiar with. I think it would be very different to the kind of histories we're familiar with. Um, it would include, as I've said, groups like, like the MAD crew and the S. SPK, the Socialist Patients Collective, and so forth. And you might end up with a very different understanding of the history of madness than we have at the moment. Um, at the same time, I think it might, I hope at least it might be useful for thinking today about the possibility about mad uh, and neurodivergent possibilities for organization, organization for kind of liberatory efforts. Um, at the very least for things like the development of mad or neurodivergent cultural institutions. Um, and these could be whether it's MAD or neurodivergent cooperatives, MAD studies departments, um, uh, bookshops or whatever, those the, the kind of things that um, Sophie Carmichael was talking about. And so these are things I think are worth fighting for. And I think having a kind of name and a concept might be helpful there for at least for at least some time. Um, so really, I think this is uh, a tool for kind of combating epistemic and other forms of domination. And it's also a tool to help think about practical possibilities. Um, so that's my very preliminary neurodivergent power. Thanks. Right. Thank you so much, Robert Chapman, for this great talk. I think we can give a virtual round of applause for our speaker.